This tutorial will introduce GIS and why you should use it for community projects. It will introduce QGIS, free open source software, how to set up the QGIS system defaults, the difference between raster and vector files, an explanation of grid references, and finish with a look at the QGIS graphic user interface. GIS stands for Geographic Information System. It's software that allows information such as text to be linked to a map and then analysed. The most common way to use it is to create a database where fields on a table are attached to features on a map. Google Maps and Google Earth where you can click on symbols to find out information about what's at that location are examples of simple GIS. It's capable though of doing much much more. Think of it as smart mapping. So why use GIS? Here's a few reasons. It's a great way to gather information together in one place. It gives you new opportunities to analyse that information. It can show relationships between different places or different types of feature and this can help you recognise how places changed over time. It'll help you to produce thematic maps highlighting places with similar properties and it lets you combine different sorts of information, for example to look for links between archaeological sites and soil types or underlying geology. In theory it makes it easier to share information, allowing your work to enhance existing historic environment records, which will make sure that future planning and land management decisions take into account the existence of historic features. It also helps ensure that your work is available to other researchers now and in the future. To make sure that you produce data that can be shared, you need to use a GIS that has a native file type that can be read by other GIS software. QGIS is a powerful free open source GIS. It uses the Esri shapefile as its native file type which is the most commonly used GIS file format and this makes data created in QGIS perfect for sharing and enhancing existing records. A strength of QGIS is its user friendly interface but don't let that fool you. Behind that are many powerful functions and tools most of which you'll probably never use. It can therefore be used by everybody from complete beginners to power users. It's used by large organisations, academic researchers and community projects around the world and it works on different software platforms. There's also lots of online support and tutorials and did I mention it's free. When you first run QGIS you'll have to set up some of the system settings. So we go to settings, options and go down these tabs to map tools and make sure that the preferred measurement units is meters and the preferred angle units is degrees. Then go to the CRS tab which is coordinate reference system and in both boxes select EPSG 27700 OSGB 1936. This can be difficult to find because there is a huge list of different coordinate reference systems listed but you'll find it under transverse Macanta. So once that's all set up now the default system setup will be the Ordnance Survey National Grid and all new projects that you start will have that as the coordinate reference system and all new layers that you build in the GIS will also be set to that coordinate reference system. GIS data comes in two basic formats, raster and vector. A raster is an image file that's composed of individual pixels such as a scanned map or aerial photograph. The resolution of the image controls the size of the pixels and therefore the range of scales that you can use it at. And when you zoom in details lost and you'll only see pixels. In contrast vector data uses coordinates to define a feature and these can be points, lines or polygon. Vector data is not affected by changing scale and it will look the same if you zoom in and out. To define location in the GIS you should be using Ordnance Survey grid references and this is how they work. The UK is divided up into 100 by 100 kilometre grid squares which start at a point off the Isles of Scilly. These squares are usually identified by a two letter code that represent a distance east and north of the origin point. Next are grid squares at 10 km intervals numbered from 0 to 9 from the southwest corner. The numbers run left to right for eastings and upwards for northings. Next are squares at 1 km intervals. This is the grid square that you'll be most familiar with. 
Again, these are numbered from 0 to 9 from the southwest corner. If you want to identify a location closer than one kilometer, you estimate the coordinate within the one kilometer grid square, once again measuring across then up. A six figure grid reference locates a point to the nearest 100 meters. An eight figure grid reference locates a point to the nearest 10 meters. A 10 figure grid reference locates a point to the nearest meter. In a GIS we use a holy number format by showing the letter code in its numeric equivalent, which you can find along the margin of any OS map. So a 10 figure grid reference becomes a 12 figure grid reference. Now don't worry if your screen doesn't look quite like this. I've decluttered by turning off various panels and toolbars by going to view and either panels or toolbars. And this lets you customize the look and feel of QGIS to suit your preferences. Now below the toolbar is the map canvas where maps are displayed and where we can draw and edit map layers. To the side is the map legend box. Other tabs can be added here but the layers tab is probably the only one that you will use. Now fundamental to GIS is the concept of layers and these are collected into projects. Layers will be either raster or vector files and when you set up a project you add layers and by saving the project all those layers will be present next time you open the project. As you can see here. Layers contain different sorts of data and can be stacked in any order and their visibility can be turned on or off. Layers will be either raster or vector files and their appearance can be changed by right clicking and opening the properties dialog. This scan map is a raster file and you have fewer options to make simple changes to the appearance of a raster file. Under the general tab you can check that the CRS is correct and if it's not change it. You can set scale dependent visibility so that the layer will only appear within a certain scale range. You can use this if you have two maps, one more detailed than the other and you want to show a more detailed view when zoomed in or a less detailed view when zoomed out. The transparency tab allows you to make the layer transparent using several different methods. In contrast, a vector layer gives you access to more options because vector files consist of map elements which have individual properties in an attribute table. Vector files can contain points, lines or as in this case polygons. The general tab is the same as for rasters but the style tab allows you to change the colour and pattern of fill as well as its transparency. You can also add labels from the attribute table. For point data you can give it either a single symbol for all of the features or you can specify a symbol style for different values in the layers attribute table. We'll have a quick look at some of the tools along the, the top toolbar now. A very important button this is to save your project. Over here we have various tools for moving the map around the screen. Then various tools for zooming in and out. And this tool here is a really useful one if you just want to make a quick query. When you have a layer selected you can just quickly click on a an item in that layer and it'll bring up information about what is actually there. Further along we have various tools to select an item, a button to deselect items and then here we have various tools to measure lines, areas and angles. 